So um, a lot of you, uh, a lot of us, I think, were, were blindsided by the recent and rapid rise of woke culture, um, by which I mean a now mainstream set of disjointed and incompatible ideas and, and practices, I guess, whose unifying aim is to basically destroy Western civilization. Um, and part of what I've argued both here and elsewhere is that in order to combat uh, this ideology, we need to understand the roots, uh, the philosophical roots, uh, and the premises that underlie this, this kind of woke ideology. And I've mentioned casually before that philosophy has been broken for 200 years. Uh, I've spoken occasionally about uh, the critical theorists from the Frankfurt School and, and then Marcusa and that kind of stuff. I've only vaguely really talked about postmodernism. We haven't really dug into the history of this stuff very much. Um, partially that's because the history of philosophy here is so rife to me, I'll speak for myself, it's so rife with confusing theories and perplexing claims that uh, it can kind of seem overwhelming to trace the, the thin interwoven strands of wokeism back through history to their origins. So I'm very excited today to be able to start that journey with a man whom I think is the foremost expert on this very subject. Maybe he'll disagree, but I think he's hands down the expert here. Um, that man is Dr. Stephen Hicks. Um, he's a professor of philosophy at Rockford University, Illinois. He's also the ex executive director for of the Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship and senior scholar at the Atlas Society. He's the author of six books, including his forthcoming book, Eight Philosophies of Education, and including a book that I think is a must read for anyone interested in unraveling the philosophical roots of modern leftism. That's this book here, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism, and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. He's published in several academic journals, including Business, Ethic, Business Ethics Quarterly, Teaching Philosophy, and Review of Metaphysics, as, as well as a bunch of uh, mainstream publications. Uh, he's also the host of the Open College podcast. There's a lot more I could say about him, but I'll just uh, point you to his website, stephenhicks.org. You can check it out yourself. Dr. Hicks, welcome so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Welcome to Dangerous Thoughts on Unsafe Space. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation, Carter. I'm I'm super excited about this. I'm just going to, we're going to jump in. I'm just going to ask you the big question, mm. um, which is, as a philosopher, how do you describe the woke cultural phenomenon and how did the West get mm. to this point? All right. Well, uh, so that's two hard questions right off the bat, <laughs> bundled into one. You're up to it. You're up to it. I know. Yes. Okay. So woke culture. I, I'm going to emphasize the, the culture part first to say that primarily uh, that we're not talking about a, a politics, which would be illiberal and authoritarian in various strains. So what we're interested in is this uh, widespreadness that even without political enforcement mechanisms, it's not the police coming to your door. It's not the military uh, uh, threatening you and so forth. It's what some people are doing to other people voluntarily in the private sector. Uh, uh, and what woke culture's best contrast would then would be to a kind of liberal ethos, using liberal in the philosophical sense here, uh, that has a, a, a lot of elements. Uh, so if we start off by saying, what goes into being a member of uh, uh, kind of the open, liberal, tolerant, rights-respecting civilization, uh, what's our ethos going to be? How am I going to conduct myself in public space? How am I going to expect other people to conduct myself there? Now, there, the, uh, the assumptions that have governed Western culture and then increasingly global culture, uh, as uh, many of the elements of Western culture spread, with, uh, with globalism, was the idea that we're going to respect the individual. And that's a, that's a bottom line. It's not just to say that you're going to respect everything the individual says and does, but you start with individuals and you take the notion seriously that they have their own life, they have their own mind, their own values, and I need to, in a bottom line way, uh, not infringe upon that. And I'm going to take also seriously for myself that I'm an individual with my life, my, my own goals, right, and so forth. Now, when we are social, and a lot of what we do uh, that's wonderful stuff is social stuff, that's got to be folded in. So I have to have a bottom line respect for you, your right to enter into relationships and exit relationships, and that the relationships should be mutually beneficial, uh, that I'm not going to try to uh, enforce 
my agenda on you totally against your will and I'm not going to uh, allow you to do the same sort of thing with me. At the same time, because we're individuals and life is complicated and the world is, is very complicated and we have limited time to think about all sorts of things, uh, we should expect that people are going to have uh, different opinions on lots of complicated things and they're going to have different value priorities. Uh, they're not always going to be on the same age. So the virtue of tolerance is going to come to the fore that uh, I can't expect that everybody's going to agree with me about what's true or what's important. So we're going to discuss things and uh, try to get our data sets lined up and check each other's logic, but we're going to do it in a, in a, in a civil discussion sort of, sort of way. And ultimately, uh, there's a kind of optimism. We live in the same world, ultimately. We're both rational. Uh, if we talk about things, we should be able to uh, come to an agreement. Uh, but of course, if things are complicated and time runs out, then we'll just have to agree to disagree for a while, but we're going to make progress. But even if we find we can't make any progress whatsoever, we're just going to then walk away from it and say, okay, I'm, just, I'm not going to be friends with you, or we're just not going to do, going to do business. Now, all of those are elements of, um, uh, of modern liberal culture, as I'm defining it. Now, woke culture then is going to be the opposite of every single one of those elements all of the way down. The most in your face part is the cancel part where uh, if you say the wrong thing, and it's a very hair trigger sense that you get, you have to walk on eggshells. You have to get the right thing at the right time with the right nuance, otherwise you are out uh, in, in, in fairly harsh fashion and you are condemned kind of all the way down. And even minor infractions bring out the very heavy guns. And so the, the, the emphasis seems to be on totally destroying this person, their livelihood, their reputation, and, and, and so on. So all of that tolerance and the idea that we're going to give people the benefit of the doubt and have civil discussion, all of that is out. And so that's the thing that uh, uh, is most obnoxious to people uh, raised in a liberal uh, ethos right off the bat. Uh, you are under attack. You feel that you can't say what you really think. Uh, and if you do say the wrong thing, you are, you're going to be gone. There is an expectation of uniformity uh, that is permeating work culture. Everybody has to be on the same page. And if you are not on the same page on whatever the issue of the day is, then you are not only wrong and you're going to be drummed out, but you are a bad person and you will be treated as a bad person or as a, as a, as a, as a non person. And so you get the sense right off the bat that if you're going to be a member of the club, a member of the group or whatever it is, you have to come in knowing what the approved opinions are and you kind of have to sign on to those opinions and any sort of deviation is going to be very harshly, harshly public. So all of this is soft power in the cultural space. It's a kind of cultural authoritarianism, a kind of cultural intolerance. And uh, the other element is that uh, the, the kind of the anti-individualism that comes in in a couple of forms. It's not that we're going to respect that you are your own person and you have your own values and your own perhaps weird opinions about things, that everybody has to be on the same page. And it sometimes comes in a more authoritarian form, in a top-down form. You have to conform to what we, the leaders, in this woke subculture have decided the truth is. And you have to subordinate your judgment and subordinate your values to this hierarchical uh, imposition in, in whatever subculture it is. Sometimes it comes out in a more collectivized group form that uh, people aren't seen as individuals, you are seen as representatives of a group. And the expectation is because of your race or your gender or your sex or your your, 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 your ethnic background, but in some sense, all members of those groups should be speaking with the same voice and have the same values. And so we don't need to get to know you as an individual. Uh, we just expect that you are going to conform, uh, not as an individual, but to being a kind of avatar of a, of a certain sort of group membership. Now that's a number of elements. So these are multi-dimensional characterizations. Uh, and so woke culture then is the opposite of a kind of liberal ethos. There's a lot, man, there's a lot there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's, so let's, let's talk about some, it strikes me that there's some, uh, 
underlying assumptions about non woke culture then that that come to mind. One of them is if if we can communicate to one another, there's this assumption that there's an objective reality that there is a reality that we are both members of, and right. the reason there's optimism is uh, there's also an epistemological assumption that uh, two reasoning beings given the same information will eventually reach the same conclusion about this objective reality. And so any disagreement we might have is is presumed to be a lack of information or errors that can be sussed out with enough work. Um, right. So that there's yeah, that's very well optimism. said. Yes, exactly right. So immediately we're talking about a cultural phenomenon with some political overtones, but you're quite right to say that uh, that rests on a certain set of metaphysical assumptions and epistemological assumptions. And the just as the liberal ethos rested on some epistemological and, and metaphysical assumptions. So yes, uh, what's the nature of reality? Are we all living in the same reality? Uh, and that then epistemologically, we have the cognitive uh, capacities that if they're exercised appropriately, can tap into that reality and by and large get it right. And that your cognitive apparatus and my cognitive apparatus are the same sorts of things and we're living in the same apparatus. So ultimately, even however different our starting points are, we should be able to point out the data and, and use the same logic and reach the same sorts of conclusions. So the deepest philosophical roots of woke culture then are going to be the rejections of those metaphysical and epistemological assumptions. So if you go down a long philosophical road uh, that starts from the assumption that or the argued conclusion that uh, reality is not knowable or that reality is just something that we all make up in some sense. So you get some deep skepticism or some deep subjectivism, then that's going to play out in the idea that there is no common frame of reference and there is no common set of cognitive tools that we should be using uh, so that when we come together socially, if you are really in a different reality because you've subjectively created it or your cognitive apparatus, actually, we probably shouldn't be calling it cognitive apparatus anymore. Whatever it is that you do with your, your fantasies your, or whatever, yeah, yeah. Your, your, whatever you do with your mind really is very different from what I do with my mind. There's no common uh, common way of resolving rather any differences. So the idea of civil discussion, the idea of rational discussion just goes out the window. And all we are left with is two individuals, to keep the case simple, who have different realities or only partial overlapping realities and conflicting interpretations, conflicting values, and no way to resolve those battles. Other than by force. Which, Other than you know. by, yes, non-rational, non-liberal <laughs> rational means. And so that's where the the nastiness, the, uh, the quick attack uh, uh, is going to come out. The substitution of any sort of data-driven argument or logically driven argument and immediate attacks on the person. Uh, you know, you're just saying that because you're a certain kind of person and that is meant to be a dismissal. Uh, because you just have a different right, subjectivity right. and your subjectivity is wrong by lights of our subjectivity. Because I don't believe in universal truth except for that I'm right. So all right, yeah. so <laughs> I, I want to rewind now because you're you're you touched on this a little bit and I want to pick your brain here. Let's rewind a couple hundred years and talk mm. about the enlightenment and the the counter enlightenment attack on reason. So let's just first talk about how do you what for you? What's an enlightenment thinker, and and are they all universally got it right, and they're good, or were there errors in the enlightenment that we should be aware of as we kind of think about, you know, a lot of people are looking at back yeah. at the enlightenment now, going, hey, what's going on? There's an attack on it. Yeah. What, so. All right, I'm glad that more people are looking back at the enlightenment. Yes. Uh, let's uh, Well, the, now some of them are saying let's throw it away. And so that's why <laughs> well, I'm yes. concerned, right? Yeah. Well, at least uh, we know what we're talking about. But yes, uh, no, your point is right. The roots are deep and it's a matter of uh, 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 battles fought and won on lots of different philosophical and cultural fronts a couple of hundred years ago. 
But these things move slowly and uh, counter attacks develop slowly as well. So, but yes, we do have to think in terms of generations and centuries when we, when we're talking about the deepest, the deepest assumptions. So enlightenment uh, uh, as a historical period, typically we're talking about 1700s or the, uh, some people will push things back to the middle part of the 1600s and, and bring things into the early 1800s. And I think of it as uh, the intellectual maturity of the early modern era. And it is a school of thinkers and a school of activists. Uh, and you can't expect total uniformity. There's lots of sub debates and disagreements. Uh, but what they have in common is, is, is a set of assumptions. We'll call them the philosophical assumptions, even though there are, there are arguments for them. That we do live in the natural world, that the natural world is cause and effect, uh, that it can be studied by our cognitive apparatus, our senses, our conceptual faculties, that we can develop tools of logic and mathematics and then more broadly scientific method in increasing sophistication to figure out the way the world really works. That human beings have a, have a certain identity uh, that, that can be known, that we are creatures of the natural world. Of course, we also have a, have a, a soul or a spirit or a mind that's pretty impressive. Exactly what that is, we don't quite know yet. But nonetheless, it is a, a glorious thing to be a human being and to have this very powerful brain that if uh, trained well, can uh, bring a huge amount of knowledge and everybody has this capacity. So everybody can learn to read and uh, write and become a self-governing human being who can live responsibly in a free society, economically, politically, and so on. Uh, and that then applies to uh, market orientations that people should be self-governing individuals who are able to run their own lives economically, to participate in the political process. That it also includes people from all over the world. Uh, by the time we get into the 1700s, uh, it's been a couple of hundred years since Columbus crossed the, uh, crossed the ocean and came back and all of these explorations. And yeah, people are different all over the place. And we can learn what's good from them, but also what's bad from them. But we can also be critically self-reflective on our own culture and realize that we've got a lot of things that we're doing pretty well, but some things we're doing pretty badly and we should uh, reform ourselves, uh, that we should be more open to uh, other people being fully human, even though initially they seem to be quite different. And all of these capacities, uh, the capacity for enlightenment is universal to the species. And that therefore uh, racism and slavery and seeing women as second or third class citizens, all of this starts to become more suspect. And so we should start thinking in terms of equal liberties and equal rights universally for all human beings. And then all of the political manifestations of that. Everybody should be free, rights should be universal. Uh, uh, and that anybody in principle has the capacity using their, their 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 brain to figure out the way the world works. Even if we don't become scientists, we can all become scientifically literate and interested in, in the best things in art and becoming a cultured person and so on. So it was an age of enlightenment. It was an age of extraordinary optimism that finally we have figured out kind of the key to some very important things. What has kept human beings ignorant and stupid and poor and living short lives for so many centuries. Well, it was a wrong set of attitudes, but now we know uh, we can figure out the natural world. We can do science. We can be rational individuals. We can free human beings and progress is the natural birthright of human beings. So that's the age of enlightenment in a, in a couple of minutes. That, that was excellent. So I guess we can put aside some errors that Rousseau or other people may have, have, have made or some contradictions, but but you talk about um, in explaining postmodernism, you talk about uh, this counter enlightenment attack on reason because there were definitely thinkers that saw the what you've just described as a threat to the status quo mm -hmm. or to some uh, either the religion or frankly, I think it's personally I, I view it as their own psychological need mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that they view it as a threat to. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what that? counter enlightenment attack was because this is where we yeah. really see i think the seed of what will 
eventually manifest itself as woke culture 200 years later. Yes. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Rousseau and the, the phrase, the counter enlightenment. All of those uh, theses that were put out about what the enlightenment stood for, I, I think we probably went through a dozen or so in, in very quick time. All of them are controversial. All of them need uh, lots of argumentation and all of them are subject to, to counter attack. A certain number of people in the in the 1700s, uh, uh, they're counter enlightenment, but in a more reactionary sense. It's just they are in favor of the old order, traditional politics, traditional religion, traditional social mores about the status of women and the status of uh, of people of other uh, of other ethnicities and races and so on. And so they just see the enlightenment as this. Uh, progressive, reforming, we're going to rebuild society, uh, sunny skies future as a threat to the established order. And so they're mounting a, a rear guard action. But there is another- sorry, I just want to, sorry, I might interrupt. Are, are you talking about like royalists or Edmund Burke? Yeah, like royalists kind of would people? be an okay. example. Yeah, people who are in favor of old time religion would be an example. Okay. People who just in the in the household, uh, you know, if I'm just an old fashioned sexist, I don't want my wife to have her own bank account for goodness sake. Right, that sort okay. of thing, and I'm not particularly, uh, uh, um, you know, political or or even necessarily religious. So, uh, okay. the Enlightenment is uh, is uh, putting all of the elements of culture and all of the elements of the the prevailing intellectual framework under the microscope. Some of them we're going to keep, but we're willing to jettison the ones that we don't think uh, are are going to work. Okay. So. The counter enlightenment people, I think, who lead into postmodernism are not just reactionaries. Instead, what they are are going to be people who say this old pre modern traditionalism, I think that has failed. And perhaps now that the genie is out of the bottle, uh, we can't stuff it back in. And so we're not going to be able to go back to the old way of doing things. Nonetheless, we are disquieted at the direction the modern world is going. Uh, and it might be that the disquiet uh, is to say that we want to maintain a lot of the old ways of doing things, but just in a much more slow, gradual, reformist way. Or it might be that we think the direction the Enlightenment is going is wrong-headed. And while we are going to be modernists, we want to take the, the modern world in a very different direction. So a kind of politics as a if, if we use that as a working example you might say old-fashioned pre-modern politics is very hierarchical you know captured in royalism and aristocracy and codified in in feudal hierarchy and so there your organizing principle socially and politically is the better people are at the top and then the pretty good people and then the so-so people and then, then the, the lowest run of people and so on. And that's the way things should go. Now, by the time we get into the modern world, modern politics is blowing up all of the old feudal hierarchies. It's, it's leveling uh, in one sense and freeing. Everybody is going to be free and everybody is going to have equal rights. But now there's a follow-up question then is supposing we're not going to go back to feudalism what exactly is this mixture of freedom and equality that we're going to work out in the modern world? And one of the bifurcations, as we know, is those people who want to say there's not really a dualism between freedom and equality because, you know, people should all be equally free and those should be universal rights. And there are those, by contrast, who want to say there is a duality there that if we give people freedom, there's going to be too much inequality, particularly in, in economic dimensions. Some people will become rich. Some people will remain poor or go bankrupt. So we need to prioritize equality and have at most nested freedoms and limited freedoms within an overall equalitarian type of framework. And that's going to take your politics in, the, in, the, in a very different direction. Uh, and so what we have then is uh, both of them are modern, and both of them are rejecting the traditional pre-modern structures, but they're going to have a knockdown debate over, uh, 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 over what direction the modern world should come. Now, the counter-enlightenment thinkers, uh, and I would put Rousseau in the first uh, rank of counter-enlightenment figures. And uh, thank you for showing the image of my book. I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the little advertisement there. But my, one of my subtitles, or the subtitle is From Rousseau to Foucault. So I do see him, even though he's living smack dab in the middle of the 1700s, uh, and sometimes just for historical dating, people will put him as an enlightenment thinker. 
Uh, but I think that's a, that's a philosophical mistake that rather than people just living in a certain era, you have to look at what they actually said. And Rousseau is one of these guys who says, every element of the enlightenment that I went through, the individualism, the tolerance, uh, the, the, the liberalism uh, and so on, Rousseau is against all of that. Uh, you know, that, that science is a progressive, uh, a liberating force. He thinks that science is a corrupting force, that people should be, as individuals, free to pursue their own self-interest. He doesn't believe in any of that. He thinks we should have a collective general will that's manifested in state representatives. The idea of separating church and state uh, and then letting people go their own direction on religious matters. He's opposed to the separation of church and state <laughs> to the extent of, uh, you know, uh, agreeing with the uh, the death penalty for people who go against the approved of state religion. The idea of uh, you know, all of the modern liberals saying we need to have free speech and, uh, and freedom of the press and so on. Rousseau is against that and he's in favor of censorship and so on. So he's not an old fashioned pre-modernist. He doesn't think we're, we're going. He hates the monarchy. He hates the aristocracy, but he also hates this liberal individualism that seems to be going in a more pro-science, pro-capitalism direction as well. So there is the beginnings of a counter-enlightenment that goes off in a very different direction. And and so I guess, do we jump then from Rousseau to Kant? Like who's the first mm. major philosophical figure there that that arms arms some of these postmodernists? Yeah, again, um, uh, you know, calling Rousseau a counter-enlightenment guy is a little bit controversial, but not, I think, that controversial. Uh, the, the place of Kant is much more hotly contested in this, in this genealogy. And many mainstream in, uh, histories of the Enlightenment and many uh, you know, very uh, you know, smart people who do philosophy are convinced that Kant is a, is a respecter of reason, and that he's an, an advocate of a certain kind of kind of enlightenment vision. And my view of Kant is that on many secondary and tertiary issues, you can find indeed pro-reason and pro-enlightenment things in Kant, but that on the most fundamental issues in philosophy, Kant re represents a rejection of, uh, of core pro-reason principles, pro-enlightenment principles as well. So, uh, this takes us into some deep epistemological territory. It takes us deep into some territory in metaethics and some deep territory about human nature. Uh, but I do think that Kant, uh, with what he calls his Copernican revolution, marks a very fundamental shift away from objectivity as the ruling standard that philosophers and by extension all of us should strive for to a kind of collectivity or sorry, subjectivity. And he's quite explicit about that. Uh, in some ways, you can read Kant and see that he is in favor of uh, saving some sort of religion, even though religion, traditional religion, is going to have to be modified in some ways. He is reactionary in the sense that he sees all of this emphasis on naturalism and science and giving arguments for everything, that that's going to lead people in the direction of agnosticism, that the arguments for the existence of God don't work very well. And the counter arguments are pretty strong. And so if we go too far down this road and say reason can answer every question about the nature of the universe, there's not going to be any room left for religion. And so he has this very pregnant line in his most important book where he says, I'm going to uh, place limits on, on, on knowledge. I'm going to deny knowledge of certain important things in order to retain a certain kind of faith in place. Uh, this idea that people should be uh, uh, free to pursue their happiness uh, and, and the idea of, of you know, the, the, the birthright of human beings as the pursuit of happiness as a principle that was fairly widespread in, in the Enlightenment, obviously in the American context, it made its way into the Declaration of Independence. Kant is not in favor of happiness as a fundamental ethical principle. Uh, he's much more in favor of uh, obligation and duty as being more fundamental. Happiness is is uh, is quite derivative. Now, all of those points are interpretive points, and uh, we'd have to talk about uh, uh, those in, in in fuller detail, uh, and with recognition that there is interpretive controversy on all of them about about Kant. But I do think that Kant is extraordinarily important. Uh, Schopenhauer, my interpretation of Kant really is 
just to throw some other big names out there, Schopenhauer's interpretation of Kant and Nietzsche's interpretation of Kant and uh, John Dewey's interpretation of Kant and Ayn Rand's interpretation of Kant. There is a, a main line here that sees Kant as marking a fundamentally destructive turn uh, on Enlightenment values and uh, uh, on some secondary things. He was still on board with the asp uh, aspirations of the Enlightenment, but he represents a, an undercutting, kind of a sawing off of the branch that you are that you are sitting on. Now, other people will want to argue that Kant is not so much the bad guy that someone like David Hume uh, with his epistemological skepticism is more important. I'm open to that argument. Uh, uh, I have reasons why I think Kant is a little more important than Hume. Uh, at the same time, Hume is extraordinarily important uh, as well. So the point just is that by the time we get to the latter part of the 1700s, uh, the, the, what is typically seen as the golden days of the Enlightenment, there is the beginnings of a counter-Enlightenment. People like Rousseau and Hume and Kant who are starting to be more skeptical about the aspirations of the Enlightenment and in some cases outright hostile to the underlying premises that make the Enlightenment project possible. Now, something that you've talked about, and correct me, I I, I don't know if this is controversial about Kant because I'm not, I don't go to the whatever cocktail parties you philosophers go to, I'm not invited. So mm. I don't know if this is controversial, but- uh, well, A lot of I, them I'm disinvited from too, so. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, my my understanding is that he is one of the first to uh, divorce uh, reason from correspondence to reality, um, and and that's really the 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 move that you're talking about that yes. can kind of be leveraged later on by future philosophers. Is that is that controversial or is that just accepted? Well. <clears throat> Some people want to argue that the divorce is not as final or the divorce is not as strong as those in my interpretive camp want to make it. Uh, and also some will argue, and here I think there's a confusion, that, uh, uh, that they will say that Kant said, we divorced reason from reality. And they're on board with that. But nonetheless, Kant argued that we all have the same cognitive apparatus and it, that it works the same way. And so what we are all doing is subjectively constructing a subjective reality, but it's the same subjective reality that we are all constructing. So we can all still have the same language, the same logic, and we can still talk uh, uh, um, with each other. We can still do a certain kind of science and so on. So it so, works in the phenomenal world, and we can just ignore this noumenal thing. Basically. That's right. That? That's right. So okay. and, and then whether the noumenal matter world matters or not is then the important point of contention. Okay. So, uh, so then what they want to, to, to argue is if we have universal subjectivity, we're still okay. And we're still going to have the same rules of language, the same rules of logic. Uh, and so uh, you can't just make up your own rules and, and so forth. And so there's going to be a kind of reason game that we still have to play. And they're fine with that. Now, the point on the other side is to say, well, universality is not the most fundamental point here. The, the most important thing is, is my mind in contact with reality? And can I come to know reality? And if your point is that I can't know reality, then uh, the rest doesn't really matter. So, right. you know, just to take a kind of analogy, we might say that we're all agreeing that we are going to play the rules of chess. And so everybody is going to play chess. And so that means, yes, we can agree what the rules are. We can enforce the rules. We're all going to be able to play the game and we can have some wonderful chess encounters and build up a, a magnificent chess playing culture. But uh, if your question is, what's the relationship between chess and the real world? Uh, and the point just is that we have made up these rules and we have no idea if the rules of chess really map onto the way the real world is, then I'm bothered by that because I don't want necessarily to play an artificial game. I want to play in the real world. And so this issue of whether our cognitive 
faculties are in contact with reality is the most important one. Now there on my reading, Kant is very clear, very explicit repeatedly about the way reality really is and not just this phenomenal reality that we have constructed subjectively. We have no clue. We, 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 uh, a couple of points he wants to say, maybe we can suggest there are some regulative principles out there, but uh, he backs away from that. Uh, and he wants to say, you know, whether God really exists or not, we have no clue. Whether the world is deterministic or not, we have no clue. And we can't answer that question. Whether there's an ultimate teleology, uh, uh, that the world is going in a certain direction, we have no clue. Whether the world is eternal, infinite, all of these metaphysical uh, questions about the underlying structure of reality, he wants to say th those are just closed off to us. We can't speak meaningfully at all about the real nature of reality. And for my way of doing philosophy, that's the most important question for, for a philosopher. And so Kant not, uh, um, mounts a, a significant turn. Well, I mean, I guess without really taking a position on that, we can just look at what future philosophers uh, made of Kant. I mean, we can jump to Hegel, who's one of my least favorites. <laughs> uh, and see what see what he did he did can we can we maybe i know we don't have a lot of time but can we maybe briefly just say okay let's trace from like i, I don't know hegel schopenhauer heidegger up through critical theory bam we're at postmodern i mean i don't know how, that's a big ask but like is there yeah. is there a, is there a quick trace that we can do that's like here's how this sure. stuff manifests because no one today is saying I'm saying that there are infinite number of sexes and biology is not a thing because of Immanuel Kant. No one's saying right. That, no, right? no, you're absolutely right. And and there, you know, people will start talking about uh, kind of family lineage traits, and that's a very useful thing to make. But you know, you know, even though you, you know, will scare, share some genetic things with your great grandfather, and that might say some things about you. Uh, so you have a bunch of other great grandfathers and grandmothers in the mix. Right. And there are some evolutionary things that happen over the generations. So uh, this is uh, the point about Kant is just a very general turning to say we're going to be doing philosophy in a very different way. But there are still lots of options uh, about how in particular that's going to be worked out, depending on what the philosophers in the subsequent generations uh, decide decide to do so. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we can go in twenty or forty year chunks uh, just to sure. hit some of the some of the big names. So yes. Uh, so if we take someone like Schopenhauer, who's in the next generation, and Schopenhauer wants to say, yeah, if, you know, if Kant basically nailed it on on epistemological issues, but then his twist is going to be to say what Kant showed, and these are going to be very potted uh, things that are, will drive the scholars wild, right? But uh, what Kant has shown is that our cognitive faculties of our senses and reason and logic and mathematics and so forth cannot come to know reality. Uh, and what someone like Schopenhauer then is going to say, well, all Kant then has shown is that if we try to use these pro-reason faculties to try to get to reality, we're not going to be able to do it. But human beings are not these creatures of pure sensibility or pure reason. We also have emotions and passions. And so maybe what we need to do to try to get to reality is turn off our reason and have, strive for a kind of emotionalist connection or intuit our deepest non-rational drives. And on the basis of that, we might be able to feel some sort of connection to, to reality. So uh, for example, Schopenhauer will say, if you take the experience of listening to uh, instrumental music, where there's no words, no lyrics, and so on, and you'll notice that some of you know, things start to happen to you. You get riled up and your, your mind is trying to grope for images and to try to put a plot structure on what's going on. That's just the wrong way to do things. Right? Instead, what you need to do is let the music take you to a certain place, and it's all chaotic and passionate and driving, but in some sense, you are getting more of an intuition about the nature of, uh, of true reality. So one of the legacies of Kant is to say, if reason can't know reality, then to try to strive to connect with reality, we have to be non-rational or irrational and explore all sorts of irrationalist methods of trying to get there, maybe through the arts or taking drugs or music or, or some, sort of, uh, some sort of method. So there is the rise of lots of irrationalist schools of philosophy 
uh, in the post-Kantian generation. And as you're suggesting earlier, a lot of them will say, we've read our Kant, and that's why we're doing what we are doing now. Now, others will try to take things in a more uh, religious direction. So if you think of someone like Kierkegaard, a generation later, going to say, yeah, Kant is exactly right. Uh, if we try to uh, try to prove the existence of God, then reason is just going to either show the futility of all of the traditional arguments, and it's going to make us skeptics and agnostics and, God forbid, into atheists, and it's going to totally destroy the meaning of life. But then again, I am a kind of person where I feel a commitment to a certain kind of religious heritage that uh, any sense of meaning and significance in the world subjectively is, is, it comes from my, my religious commitment. And Kant has shown that I can't get there rationally. So what I need to do is, even though I know my religion is irrational and contradictory and says all of these things about miracles and blah, 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 I'm going to make an irrational subjective commitment to it. And it's only through that that anybody can find some sort of meaning in their life and so on. And so already, you know, we're into the middle part of the 1850s, and we've got a couple of different strands of irrationalist philosophy going on. Now, I don't want to belabor the point because there's lots of variations. Kant, uh, sorry, uh, Hegel is one. Uh, Nietzsche, by the time we get to the end of the 1800s, Heidegger on into the early part of the 20th century. And that's going to start setting us up for the school, uh, the Frankfurt School types of thinkers and critical theory. And I know you want to say a few things about that. Okay. And all of the postmodernists who are paying very close attention and learning about Kant and Nietzsche and Heidegger and so on. Some of them German, some of them French. Uh, and so we're uh, the story is just going to get darker and more and more irrationalist as time goes on. Uh. Yeah, so I, I one thing I, I learned from reading you, which I didn't realize, was I've always thought of I've always thought of Marcuse and the critical theorists as kind of distinct from the postmodernists, but it makes sense that they both have the same parents, basically. Um, Yes. No, I think, right? you're, I think both of those things you said are right. They are distinct, but they're also related. Um, so they're kind of like first cousins. And if we want to stick with the, uh, with the family Fair. tree metaphor. But they share some, this is why they share some fundamental philosophic beliefs, right? And which is why I mentioned Heidegger earlier. I'm wondering if you mm -hmm. can tease out for people like, what does it mean? What are the, what is different from critical theorist versus postmodernist, because a lot of, there seems to be a debate right now. Thaddeus Russell is, 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 a, is a guy who's blaming the critical theorists for everything about woke. And then you have someone like uh, James Lindsay, maybe who's, who's blames the postmodernists. Um, what's the difference between those two for just for lay people? Uh, okay. Well, the, yeah, we haven't defined postmodernism yet. Uh, <laughs> True. <laughs> I guess we should do that also. <laughs> yes, that's right. And we have to talk about critical theory, right, as well. So uh, how do we do this in, in, in short? I, I think the postmodernists are a later and more skeptical development than the critical theorists. So what I would say about the critical theorists is they are people who have read their Kant and they have read their Hegel and they have read their Marx. And those are going to be the three most important thinkers for, for them. So what they want to argue is that uh, there is a kind of evolutionary development to society. We're not so much talking about real reality anymore, but nonetheless, human beings have a certain psychological makeup. And due to the nature of that psychological makeup and all the experiments that we try, there is a logic to how society goes. Marxism is one of the attempts to do a social science of how that how that development goes. Now, what happens, though, if uh, and I'm assuming we know something about what Marxism is, you know, class conflict and ultimately there's going to be a revolution and, uh, and, and capitalism will go by the by and we'll have a dictatorship of the proletariat and then bring about a kind of a kind of socialism. Uh, so. There is this dialectical evolutionary development that's given a Marxist turn. And almost all of the critical theorists are well-trained in philosophy. They're writing dissertations on Kant. They're writing dissertations on Hegel. And they're writing dissertations on Karl Marx. What we find by the time we get to the 
early part of the 20th century is some problems for the Marxist framework. So the Marxist framework had said, for example, that uh, you know the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer, just to take a, you know, one important uh, a slogan that comes out of the Marxist tradition. So what do you do when you get to the 20th century and it seems like the rich are getting poorer, but also the poor are getting poorer, right? So that social science prediction doesn't seem to be working out. Marx had said the middle class is going to be squeezed out by the brutal capitalist competition. Some of them will claw their way and become extraordinarily rich capitalists, but the, most of the middle class is going to be forced down into the poorer proletariat. Uh, and so what do you do when you start to realize that actually the middle class is getting bigger and bigger? So there, there's more rich people, there's more middle class people, and there's fewer and fewer poorer people. And all of these seem to be the opposite of Marx's predictions. But in your heart of hearts, you think there's something to this Marxist framework, that there is a kind of dialectical evolution, uh, uh, and you hate capitalism. <laughs> uh, and so you that's are- the key. Kind of they, all like, they all hate well, capitalism. That's, that is a key. Uh, <laughs> but you're also very smart, and you are very philosophically trained. Now, typically what the uh, the critical theorists are doing, and so these are the first generation Frankfurt School people. And so, uh, uh, you know, someone like uh, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno and a little bit later, Herbert Marcuse uh, and others are going to do is to say that basically this Hegelian Marxist framework is right, but our social psychology has been too simplistic. You know, that we thought, you know, perhaps as good Marxists, that this materialistic clashing economic interest story was the only story that we needed to tell. But it turns out that social uh, dynamics and social psychology is a lot more complicated, that it's not only economic clashes, it's also religious clashes, it's also ethnic clashes, it's also uh, man and woman clashes uh, across sex and gender lines as well. And uh, the ideas of, uh, of developing class consciousness, that uh, the, the way reality is, uh, is, is supposed to be slapping poor people in the face with how alienated and exploited they are, uh, should be so apparent that their, their consciousness is going to be raised. The forces of oppression and psychological repression are a lot stronger than we thought in, uh, in, in the first couple of generations of Marx. So what they will do then is turn to someone like Sigmund Freud, and Sigmund Freud becomes very important. So Freud had published his first big book, The Interpretation of Dreams, uh, uh, in 1900. I think actually it was published in 1899, but 1900 probably looked sexier for the publisher. So uh, the official date is 1900. Uh, and then we have this new Freudian psychology that takes the intellectual world by, by storm. And in some ways, Freudian psychology seems to be the opposite of Marxist psychology. You know, so Marxist psychology is very tabula rasa, right? We're born into a society, we're born into a class. Everything that's in our minds is just totally conditioned into us by our class membership. And so the different classes will be in conflict with each other and, and the conflict will become apparent to one side and the revolution will happen and so on. So what we find though with Freud is a uh, kind of a, in part a Darwin inspired, partly a Nietzsche inspired idea that the human psyche is much more instinctually driven. And so if we take the kind of Darwinian story or a pop Darwinian story, I don't think this is the right the right way to read Darwin, but is to say that we are not, in fact, tabula rasa creatures born into a social uh, society. Instead, we are biological creatures, and our consciousness is this very Johnny-come-lately faculty that has been developed, but it's overlaying what has been a series of instincts programmed into us by biological survival uh, necessities across eons. Right? We're not talking centuries or millennia, we're talking eons, hundreds of thousands of years. And before we were humans, we were animals, uh, uh, non-rational animals for, for a lot longer. And then we take the pop Darwin story and say, well, how do, uh, how, do, how do individuals and species survive? Well, they survive by killing each other and eating 
<laughs> eating uh, and, and incorporating the other one. And so the, the ones that are the most successful predators, uh, if we just talk about that side of the divide, the most aggressive, the, the fastest, the swiftest, and so on, and the ones that you know uh, have the strongest drive to be predators, those are the ones that are going to survive. The ones that are a little bit nicer, and hey guys, can't we get along with each other? Those are the ones that lose and they get eaten, so to speak. And then the other thing is reproduction. So it's going to be the strongest that eat, but also the strongest that are able to provide and be attractive to, uh, to the other sex. And so they're going to have more sex, they're going to have more offspring, and they're going to be selected for, and then, so we're then going to pass on our genes. So, uh, and it's going to be the ones that have the strongest sex drive also, and to act on it that are going to leave the most offspring. So what we then have is this very biologically, instinctually driven, di driven narrative that says really it's aggression and sex that is driving uh, uh, biological survival. And we human beings, that's, that's what we are. And so the, the Freudians and will then say, well, look, if you're just honest with yourself, you know, basically you're, you're a seething bundle of drives, right? You want to, uh, you know, to, to, to anybody who disagrees with you, you just want to beat that person up and humiliate them. And if you could kill people and get away with it and have that unlimited power, you would like to do that. And you just want to have sex as often as possible with anybody you want and so on. And so, yes, in the modern world, we've told ourselves this nice story about being civilized human beings and so forth. And to some extent that works, but really it doesn't change the fact that you are a sex and aggression machine. It just uh, means that you've pushed underground and you've tried to train those instincts in socially acceptable ways uh, if you've had certain kinds of training and so on, but they're still there. So this potted version of a Freudian story, uh, 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 we then want to say, well, why aren't we acting on our sex drive all the time? Why aren't we all just punching each other and stabbing each other all of the time? Well, because our capacities for repressing our instinctual drives are in fact pretty strong. And so uh, we do have to explain human behavior largely in terms of these drives wanting to manifest themselves, but also civilization's ability to restrain them and redirect them in various ways is part of the, of the human story. And that means that the human psychological story has to become more complicated and the human psychological story has to become a lot more uh, complicated as well. So what we find then in the first generation of Frankfurt School, these are the guys now writing, you know, basically getting their PhDs in the 1920s. And so everybody's reading Freud and everybody's asking themselves the question, how did we turn into such beastly animals in World War I? And, and, and doing all those nasty things in the in the trenches to each other. Uh, and maybe there's something to this Freudian story. And so if we're going to understand, even if we are Marxists and we think that there's a lot of alienation and exploitation out there, and we think that the class warfare is probably right and we do want some sort of socialist society in the future, nonetheless, we're going to have to take into account what Freud can teach us about psychology and social psychology about how all of that alienation and exploitation that's there in modern so-called enlightenment capitalist society uh, is really there, but it's being repressed and redirected and rechanneled in various ways. And so we, the critical thinkers, are going to have to be like the psychoanalyst where on the surface, things seem to be civilized and nice and people have their manners. But if we, with our trained critical eye, tear off the, the surface, we can see the seething irrationality and what's really going underneath the, the surface of apparently peaceful civil society. And that's what uh, uh, kind of the, the philosophical origin of Frankfurt School. So it's a marriage of some Freud with some Marx and then behind them, some kind of Kantian Hegelian themes. And and this is done on a collective basis, right? Because you are the member of your group. So when they peel back yeah. something, what they see is is those passions as as you are this avatar of this group with these passions, or is, are they still individualist at this point a little bit? No, no, they're, they're very thoroughly uh, collectivistic, although what collectivities you are talking about is, is going to vary quite, quite dramatically. So there are going to be those who are going to emphasize the Marxist element more and say it's your economic class memberships that matter 
more. Those who want to emphasize a Freudian, kind of a pure Freudianism are going to say the biological differences between males and females uh, is perhaps a more important force, you know, that, that females uh, you know, they, the, the, are, are the ones who give birth. You, know, you, you can't be an aggressive predator when you're pregnant and you have to look after the, uh, the, the children. And so there is going to be a psychologically different developmental direction to the female compared to the male. And that's going to be more important than economic class memberships for the more uh, Freudian emphasizing ones. There are those who are going to emphasize uh, uh, linguistics and language. And they're going to say that uh, uh, the important group is you know, that, that we are talking about psychology and social psychology, but it is true that human beings are a language using animal. And then they're going to say that naturally we are born into different language groups. And uh, uh, each of those languages has say a different fundamental grammar. And uh, if that grammar gets into your mind and shapes your mind at a very early age, uh, then you are going to conceptualize the world in a very different way. And so if we have a kind of Kantian grammar understanding of, of, uh, of, 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 of language, then we're going to have different language collectivities that are going to be conceptualizing the world in very different ways with different theories and different value frameworks and so on. And that might be more important than cl economic classes and it might be more important than sex and gender differences as well. So it might be language that feeds into ethnicity. So which member of the Frankfurt School emphasizing which elements in the mix, uh, there are going to be differences among them. What the Frankfurt School has in common though is the idea that we do need to have a much more mixed, complicated understanding of psychology uh, 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 and social reality than Marx envisioned. Um, uh, and it's not going to be any sort of liberal, individualistic, capitalistic uh, uh, framework that comes out ultimately. Now, I want to say a couple of things to contrast them with the, with the postmodernists, because the postmodernists, I think, are going to be a more skeptical evolution a little bit later. Uh, this story that we're telling about Frankfurt School thinkers is to say, well, we still think there is such a thing as human psychology and that right. it works a certain way. And there are certain social realities and that there is a kind of logic, even if it's a kind of dialectic logic, and that we can do a kind of social science. And if we're just uh, working out the more complicated theory well enough, we should be able to predict uh, where, the, where, the, where the leverage points are going to be for making the revolution uh, in the future. So they're still functioning as kinds of social scientists with a quasi-realistic understanding, cause and effect understanding of the way social reality and individual psychology reality works. The postmoderns are going to be skeptical about all of those fundamental claims. So things are going to become a lot more, uh, I don't know what the right word would be, anarchistic uh, and anti-realistic than, uh, than the Frankfurt School. Now, I just want to point out, though, one thing that's weird to me is I always think of politics as something that is uh, that relies upon a, a metaphysical and ethical framework first um, and and a and an epistemological framework before you can kind of get into what politics, mm. how how policy, how people should relate to one another with respect to a government. But it seems like all of these philosophers that you're talking about, and I notice it you know, with the Frankfurt School basically on, because this is true for most postmodernists with a few exceptions, the Marxism aspect, or at least neo-Marxism, isn't really questioned. Um, that mm. the politics <clears throat> is kind of like, oh, obviously we want the revolution, but it didn't work this way. So we just predicted it wrong. And now we have to adjust our philosophy. Do they ever go back and say, maybe Marxism is wrong in the first yeah. place? Uh, I uh, well, Marxism again, and, and the history of Marxism is a is a big tent, and I think there are some. There there there, there okay. are lots of people over the course of the 20th century, even late 19th century, who were Marxists when they were young, and they thought that Marxism was a kind of scientific approach to socialism, and so they did have a respect for science. And then when the evidence uh, came against them, they changed their minds. Now, okay. some of them went in neo-Marxist direction. Some of them just became middle of the road politically. And some of them became conservative, some of them and so on. But I think that's a, that's a small minority. Now, I think your, your, your point about the, 
the priority of politics relative to metaphysics, epistemology, and other philosophical issues. I think the, the, the best way to characterize that is to say, if you are going to maintain a healthy politics, you do also have to get the rest of it correct. Right. So if you are going to say, for example, we're going to have a, I don't know, a free market economy, you know, one of your assumptions there is that individuals are going to be free to run their own economic lives as producers, traders, consumers, and, and, and so on. But one of the assumptions there is you, you think that people are competent to do that. Right. Because uh, if right. you think that people are, you know, whiny babies and incompetent that need to be looked after, you're not going to advocate free market <laughs> economics, right? You're going to advocate some sort of let's look after everybody uh, paternalistically kind of kind of politics. But on what is this competence for individuals base? Well, the idea is that you know, people are, are pretty smart, you know, that they can figure out what their genuine needs are. Their, their actual circumstances and do experiments and, 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 and learn from their mistakes. That's to say, you have to think of people as pretty rational and, and uh, in order to be able to do so. And that's an epistemological, an epistemological commitment. Now, to make that kind of a point though about the, the dependence of healthy politics on underlying philosophy is not to say that everybody is going to do that. Uh, and we do know <laughs> that lots of people can make faith commitments to any sort of philosophical position, however irrational it is, and then uh, rationalize the rest or just ignore the rest to the extent that it conflicts rather with their their whatever it is that they want do they want to maintain. So it can be that you can be a you know a relatively healthy person epistemologically thinking that you're living in the in the natural world. But as a young person, when you're 17 years old, you read some Marxism and it's just overpoweringly attractive to you and you make this wholehearted commitment to to uh, to Marxism. And so you make a political commitment. And then at that point, you know, you, you're going to bump up against uh, people who disagree with you and throw counter data and argument with you. But at that point, you are so committed to it that it becomes a kind of faith for you. And you will then find ways to reject the arguments, reject the data, uh, even to the point of undercutting your own rational epistemology uh, in order to maintain your political commitments. So uh, psychologically, the order in which uh, uh, positions are held is not necessarily the healthy order that's going to generate a proper politics. That makes that makes sense. That makes sense. So let's. I know uh, we're we're already. I'm keeping you longer than we planned. So I I don't want to miss postmodernists though. So let's mm. let's get into the okay, postmodernists. Let's, let's do one more. Uh, yeah, we're having yeah. fun here, but I do need to uh, to make a transition. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And so uh, yeah. I'm, I know I'm, I'm uh, I want to be somewhat respective of your time. So let's just do the postmodernists and, and we can claim we got there. Uh, <laughs> what a hilarious formulation. Let's just do the postmodernists and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and then move on. Wasn't well thought out. But okay. okay. Uh, no, I think what uh, what we find in the in the postmodernists will be, and this is in the next generation. I think when Frankfurt School it's being formed in the twenties, thirties. There's a bit of a pause, and obviously in the nineteen forties during the war and so on. But the the postmodernists start coming online in the late nineteen fifties. Uh, sorry, in the late nineteen forties and on into the into the into the nineteen fifties. So uh, <clears throat> uh, so there the the big names are going to be people like. Uh, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, Richard Rorty, and they're all getting their PhDs in the late 1940s and on into the into the 1950s. So they are not quite a generation later. And many of them will have read Frankfurt School. Uh, all of them have read their history of Marxism, but all of them also are PhDs in philosophy, and they are doing uh, 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 work in epistemology. Derrida is doing a lot of work in epistemology and the philosophy of language. Uh, the same thing is true of Foucault. He's also getting advanced work in psychology. Uh, Richard Rorty is, uh, is getting a first-rate uh, education in, in epistemological work uh, and, 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 and hardcore analytic uh, uh, Anglo-American philosophy. Uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard also, uh, uh, and in some ways, I think he's almost the deepest philosophically of all of the postmodernists. 
uh, very well read in Kant, in Hegel, uh, and, and thinks of himself as a kind of Marxism as well. And I think what they are doing, though, is uh, they are on the epistemological and metaphysical issues more skeptical than the Frankfurt School thinkers. They, they, they recognize in a, I think a deeper way the ultimate implications of Kantian subjectivity that gets then played out in Hegel, Schopenhauer, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and so forth. And everything gets a little bit more and more skeptical all the way down until ultimately you re realize that the kinds of arguments that Kant is making in principle can be applied in all of these domains and all of these specific issues and nothing can withstand the corrosive effect of that pattern of argument. And at that point, then all of your beliefs about any sort of reality uh, have to go out the window, including this idea that somehow subjectively all human beings are, are, are constructing reality in the same way. Well, how on earth would we possibly know that? I can't get inside your head uh, to see if you're constructing reality in the same way that I'm doing. I'm, I'm struck in my... So there's a, a dramatic... Uh, subjectivity that goes on, uh, uh, on there, or, or, sorry, a dramatic subjectivity that comes out in a radical skepticism by the time we get to the, to the 50s. And the, 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 the 20 major issues that philosophers work out, you know, about the nature of perception and the nature of evidence and logic and scientific method and mathematics and statistics and conceptualization and the differences between narr narratives and factual theories and so on, all of those issues, we have to be skeptical on all of them. And so nothing survives, right? So uh, that also then applies to the value framework. Any value that we want to say is an objective value or a universal value, including Marxist values, that there is some sort of socialist egalitarian utopia that we can strive for. We can't know that that value is a, is a true value, much less a universal value for all human beings. Instead, all we are left with from their perspective is people are subjective and they seem to be formed into various groups with dramatically different understandings of the way reality works and with dramatically different values. And it's only an ongoing power struggle. So that power seems to be the only constant in this skeptical subjectivist flux. But then even to say that power used a certain way is better than power being used in other ways, we can't even say that. We're just left with amoral power. So, I mean, it, uh, you know, to, to get to get close to wrapping it up here, because I'm keeping you longer than than I said I would. It, it seems like the postmodernists have completely destroyed any cognitive ability that we would have to reason with each other, get along, communicate with each other, point at something and agree that it's there. Like and it if if that's what we're left with it makes sense that we have devolved to grunting and screaming at each other about what we feel. Yes, absolutely right. Yeah, that, that's the implication. So uh, if we can't reason, um, <clears throat> if, if reason is at best rationalization for subjective drives, then what are we left with? And it, it is, you know, if I'm going to use my mouth and I am going to use my words as a, a rhetorical power play. I'm not trying to make arguments. I'm trying to manipulate people. If I'm going to use my body, then it's going to have to come out in physicalistic form. If I recognize that the big guns, the more powerful institutions are, that are out there, uh, then I'm just going to try to use those and their power on behalf of my subjective interests against your subjective interests. So it has to become a nasty, politics, power play all the way down. And no one can tell you you're wrong. No, no, I'm not wrong. Uh, I'm the only one who has my value framework and you have yeah. your value framework and it's just going to be a kind of civil war or an uncivil so, war. All right. Okay. So what, one, one final one to say, I just have, I got a question because as a lay person, I know people in chat right now are watching this and people listening to this are thinking mm. to themselves, this sounds insane on its surface. You've got to be kidding me that this is the 
the, the this is the state of academia and has been for generations. And this is really what our finest institutions, this is the state of thought at our finest institutions. That's where we are. In sub, some subsectors of our finest institutions and a vast majority of other institutions as well. Now, <clears throat> I think overall, many of our universities are, are just fine. Many of the professional schools are wonderful, doing great work, the sciences, much of the social sciences and so on. But in the most philosophically uh, uh, charged parts of the humanities and some of the social sciences, there has been a skeptical uh, hollowing out at, and it's being replaced with a very cynical collectivized form of power play politics. So internal to the university, there is a, a battle for the soul of the university that's going to go on. Are we going to go in an enlightenment liberal education direction or are we going to go in a kind of wokest or just amoral power play direction? So uh, the battle was first uh, joined in the universities. So I think that's where uh, not necessarily in the universities, but at least in uh, in in uh, in philosophical circles, uh, the people who come up with the best arguments. You know, can we come up with a better understanding of objectivity and scientific method and, and logic and rationality and make that compelling? Then we can mount a, a successful counterattack and reform the universities and all of the other epistemologically informed institutions that really matter. That that makes sense, and, and I'm, I I hate to say we have to leave it there, but yeah. um, I'm going to try and figure out a way to entice you to come back and 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 dive into some of this stuff at some point because uh, I'm I'm just Fair fascinated well. with it all. I've got like you've I literally I have so many book like so many marks in this book okay. of stuff like oh, I've got to go read this and now I got to go read this guy I got to go <laughs> you know um, all right well let's plan so, to talk Carter it's been great. Uh, unfortunately, been really, pleasure. I do have to transition out. No, no, that's cool. But that's uh, cool. yeah, a pleasure and you have great questions. And uh, let's talk about doing it again. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye for now. Bye.